This video is sponsored by Ren. Men, masculinity, manliness, starting a fire, spray on deodorant, the general concept of meat, unironic Scarface posters, never asking for directions, quickly rubbing deodorant on your crotch when you woke up too late to shower, pooling money with your roommates to buy a samurai sword set from a convenience store, punching a bear in front of a goddamn explosion. Yeah, you could say I know a thing or two about being a man. Another thing I know, men really hate being trapped in a prison of the mind. Mental prison's not cool. It's a guy thing. But what if I told you that a lot of us men are in a mental prison? Sadly, it's true. But there's good news. Using philosophy, that prison can be escaped. What's manlier than breaking out of jail? I'm talking, of course, about the prison of gender. I know, I know, gender, ugh, right? Dudes are interested in learning about gender theory. But on the other hand, gender is fucking fascinating. It's this thing that's so important to our daily lives and how we as dudes perceive our bros and ourselves. Men love to take things apart and figure out how they work. Why not do that with gender? Men of the world, my brothers, hear me! For too long, we have been trapped behind the bars of a hateful gender penitentiary, unknowingly conditioned to become accessories to the oppression of our sisters and led by an army of unseen hands down a ruinous path of rigidly enforced, inflexible expectations. No longer, I say, let us free ourselves from this prison and create a new world where it's not weird for me to say I love you to my friend without adding bro or man to the end of it. But first, some sponsored content from Ren. Oh, hi there. If you're like me, you're probably filled with a white hot simmering rage about climate inaction. We've known about global warming for roughly 50 years now, and so far, our world leaders and the corporations they answer to have done somewhere on the high end of nothing about this. The human beings whose greed started the countdown on human existence have names and addresses. That's why there's no excuse for the rest of us not to use every resource we have available to improve the climate situation so the Earth can live long enough for the CEOs and politicians to answer for their crimes. Ren is a company that offers a simple way for you to do that. First, you gotta check out the carbon emissions calculator. This part's free, and it's just like taking an online quiz, you know, answering the questions, can't wait to find out which one of the Ninja Turtles I am, get the results, and oh no, I'm killing the Earth. Ren shows you your personal contribution to carbon emissions and gives you the context on what exactly that means. I'm about double the global average, and if everyone was like me, the Earth would be so, so handsome. I mean, it would warm by 1.5 degrees in about five years. Knowing your personal carbon emission level can be a powerful motivator for change. But remember, you may be killing the Earth, but you couldn't have done it alone. After all, there's no I in environmental catastrophe. Well, actually there is one, but there are a bunch of other letters too. We are all in an interconnected global population and we need to work together to fight the system that's causing the problem. REN helps you offset your own carbon emissions by funding grassroots projects around the world. What I appreciate most about REN is how transparent they are with what they're funding. You're not just blindly throwing money at the problem. You get to pick which projects you want to be a part of fund biochar projects in California and Scotland, turning carbon into soil and keeping it out of the air for thousands of years. Provide efficient cook stoves to refugees in Uganda, helping to drastically ease deforestation in the area as the project scales up. Protect the rainforest by funding drones for indigenous communities to monitor where illegal logging is happening. It's so important that we protect the rainforest because that's where sloths live. Offset your carbon footprint on REN, the first 100 people to sign up using the link in my description or the pinned comment of this video will get 10 extra trees planted in their name. That could be like a whole chill goblin forest. Okay, thanks to REN for making this video possible, and now let's get back to the show. Maybe you're wondering, 
Who am I to teach anyone about gender theory? What are my qualifications? I'll be 100% real with you here. I have none. I didn't study gender theory in school. I studied film, and even that I barely passed. I'm just a guy who read a few books about gender, thought they were pretty fucking interesting, listened to some podcasts, had a bunch of conversations with my dude friends about it, and I really believe that gender has, in a way, been a prison to me. But demystifying it a bit has made me a more free and empathetic person. I'd like to put together some of the things I've read and a few of my thoughts on it here, and my hope is it can help other dudes escape some of the harmful conditioning of the gender prison as well. So first, what is gender? Well, you might have been given a specific answer to this question in school, and likely much more often, you were taught about gender without realizing there was a lesson going on. Then, years later, it sometimes seems like people are saying everything you thought you knew about gender is wrong, and if you have any questions about that, you're transphobic. What gives? Hey, it's okay to feel confused and frustrated. Don't click on the Daily Wire link. Don't click it! Stay with me. Put the mouse down. It's okay to be confused. I was confused, too. Up until just a few years ago, I had a simple and incorrect understanding about gender and sex, the same one I was taught from the time I was a child. The popular understanding of sex and gender has changed a lot since then. Here's what I used to think. Sex and gender? Definitely the same thing. There's only two genders, male and female, and you can tell someone's gender by examining their standard birth-issued pissing fucking multi-tool. That's called the gender essentialist view. I actually spent most of my 20s hanging out with and engaging with a group of gender essentialist philosophers who spent their time just listing all the differences between men and women no matter how minute. These philosophers are also called stand-up comedians, and I thought they made some compelling points at the time. I believe one of them posited a compelling theory that women be shopping. For some people, there are advantages to a view like this. Gender is everywhere. It's in our language. It's in how we dress. It's in what jobs and roles we're expected or even allowed to do. For such an important topic, the essentialist explanation is quite easy to understand. Many people, myself included, find that the gender that was first predicted by whether their junk was an innie or an outie matches up quite usefully with how they'd like to live their life. But there are also disadvantages. A gender essentialist has no way to comprehend trans people, they cannot account for the existence of intersex people, and they may be confused or even feel threatened by the mere sight of someone behaving or dressing like a different gender. A dude with nail polish? Is this a sign that the West is about to fall? It may be time to consider that gender is more complicated and deserves more exploration than just unquestioningly believing whatever was foretold through mystical signs upon the body as if by some $5 palm reader of the county fair, except instead of looking at the creases in your hand to tell you when you're going to get married, they check whether or not a baby's crotch dangles to tell if it's going to prefer Coors Light or strawberry daiquiris later in life. So let's start here with the first key to exiting the prison known as gender. There's multiple keys. I don't know. There's like... Uh, like, a lot of doors to escape in this prison. I, I didn't fully think the metaphor through. Whatever. Just go with me here. But key number one is to understand the social constructivist view of gender. So this may sound weird, but just for the sake of understanding the argument, follow me here. Sex and gender are different. So you got sex, which is basically whatever genitals you were biologically born with. And then you've got gender, which is all of the social, cultural, linguistic extensions of sex. In other words, this view holds that sex is biological, but gender is a social construct. I've noticed that the idea of separating sex from gender can sometimes be frightening for people. Gender is a social construct? No way. Some people are born male. That's just the way it is. That's real. And yeah, dicks and pussies are real very real. I've personally seen them before. In real life, I've held them in my hands. But gender is very real as well, even though it's a social construct that varies widely across different cultures and through different time periods. For example, in the place and time where I grew up, girls liked pink and boys liked blue. Girls had long hair, boys had short hair. Girls got to stay home on holy marsupial night, boys had to make blood sacrifices to the Wombat King. But none of these ideas are universal. 
In many parts of the U.S., pink and blue were associated with the opposite gender up until the 1940s, when it was standardized across the board by advertisers. Long hair is associated with masculinity in many cultures, like for some of the indigenous peoples of Turtle Island. And believe it or not, I've met a lot of dudes outside of the commune who openly admit they never once brought the ritual box of platypus femurs to appease the burrowing one. I guess they don't mind being turned into eucalyptus to be digested by the infinite koala until the end of time. <laughs> anyway, all glory and respect to the children of the Bloomin' Onion, of course, but gender is a social and cultural reality, not a biological one. Important note here, because this can get confusing. While gender can be thought of as a cultural extension to sex, that doesn't mean it's tied to sex in any way. None of us fit every single gender stereotype you'd assume based on our genitalia. Some of us realize that whatever gender is associated with our dick or pussy is completely untrue for us as an entire category. These are trans people who face the reality that being perceived according to their sexed body is discordant with their gendered truth. I've heard people ask before, if gender is a social construction, why would anyone need to change theirs? Well, as a cis person, which just means I'm not trans, I'm certainly in no place to speak to the experiences and motivations behind any trans person's choice to transition publicly. However, I am a cis person with a camera and an opinion, so I'm just gonna say it. I imagine one reason why trans people might want to transition to a gender that's more true for them is that we place so many expectations and judgments on people solely based on what gender they appear to be. Check this out. English doesn't have this, but some languages gender every noun. In Spanish, keys are girls, but in German, keys are boys. Weird. Obviously, there are no biological differences between German and Spanish keys, but when German speakers were asked to give adjectives for a key, they overwhelmingly described it as jagged, rough, hard, heavy, metal, serrated, and useful. Spanish speakers described keys as golden, intricate, little, shiny, tiny, and lovely. I don't know, Spanish keys seem kind of hot, right? I feel like I'm picking up a vibe, actually. Mamacita Javesita, ay que rica. Maybe you picked up on the vibes here, but I've got my own pretty radical opinion and feeling about gender. You definitely don't have to fully agree with me. I've changed my mind about stuff several times just while writing the script for this video, so what do I know? But I think it's reasonable to ask that everything you consider biologically innate to males and females you can put that in the sex category. Everything else, everything dictated by culture, put that in the gender category. And when you do that, one thing you'll start to notice is that in almost every situation in your entire life, gender is the only one that's important. When do you really need to be concerned about biological sex outside of events associated with the process of human reproduction? Or I guess, also the process of qualifying to enter a Y chromosome beauty contest. If that's what you're doing, Break a leg, I wish you luck. And yes, sure, biological sex is important in that situation. But if you just wanna know what pronouns to use for someone, what section to shop for clothes in, or what room you should use to deposit your poop, gender is the one that'll help with that. This more flexible understanding of gender, which really is only slightly more advanced than gender essentialism, should serve you well in life. What is a man? Okay, we've left the first cell in the prison of gender, the one that represents gender essentialism, but guess what? There's another cell around that one. To get out of here, we're gonna need to have a better understanding of what gender even is. So let's become philosophical MacGyvers, but instead of picking the lock with a piece of bubblegum, a screw, and a used condom, we're gonna tie together a bunch of philosophy about gender and wedge it into the gap between the bars until we force our way through. Okay, so gender is different from sex, got it. But what actually is gender? Or as that question is more commonly asked, what is a woman? What is a woman is a question that's been in the news a bit lately. It was a gotcha question asked of US Supreme Court Justice Katanji Brown Jackson during her confirmation hearing, which she refused to answer. Then a bunch of Republicans acted like it was weird she wouldn't answer because it's the easiest question in the world, while they themselves gave pretty weak and unsatisfactory answers that 
often contradicted each other. Then there was a pretty sad right-wing attempt at a Borat-style documentary called What is a Woman? where unsuspecting people are asked this question, and then no matter what answer they give, they're dunked on by Matt Walsh, the would-be fascist Baron Cohen. The belief from the gender essentialists seems to be this. Since the question itself is grammatically simple, the answer should be as well. But that's not how philosophy works. Philosophy is all about long, winding, complex, sometimes contradictory answers to very simple questions. What is the meaning of life? Does free will exist? Why do you have so much, like, so much lubricant under your bed? Hey, <laughs> I can give you an answer, but just might take some time. That's philosophy, baby. So let's get into the weeds here, then. In my opinion, one of the best explorations of the question, what is a woman, can be found in a best-selling but very controversial book from 1990, a trippy, mind-blowing critique of feminism by a renowned professor who's committed to speaking the truth no matter how many people don't want to hear it. This is someone who is met with protests around the world when they go to give lectures by those who would silence free speech. Okay, who wrote this book, and how many Joe Rogan episodes have they been on? Well, the author is Judith Butler, and the book is called Gender Trouble, one of the founding texts of queer theory. They've never done an episode of Joe Rogan, as far as I know, but I'd definitely check it out if they did. I've watched a bunch of interviews with Butler, and they seem like a pretty chill hang. Judith Butler is a post-structuralist, a branch of philosophy that is literally sorcery. No, not really. It's a more of a body of different responses to a previous philosophical movement called structuralism, which rejects and builds upon some assumptions and concepts from that previous movement. So structuralists are interested in big ideas that can be used to explain everything. Marxism is a great example of this. Post-structuralists they think that's dumb, and push back on the idea that any such theory exists. Post-structuralism is focused on the constantly changing nature of language and how that impacts society. You know, words that transform people, language that influences perception, statements that don't describe events but are events. I mean, it sounds a lot like spells and sorcery if you ask me, but anyway. Among other things, Gender Trouble traces the genealogy of feminist thought and belief about gender. Butler relays the thoughts of various thinkers and expertly picks apart their unconsidered assumptions and incomplete conclusions using leading questions and a lot of words I had to look up in the dictionary. And then read the sentence again. And then go back and read the dictionary definition again. And then sort of realize... Judith Butler might be using the word in a way that the dictionary doesn't know about yet. So let me warn you, Gender Trouble is not a book for cowards, okay? It's like a DMT trip. At times, it will just be too much for you to understand. But what I did understand, I really liked. Butler, a feminist, poses a very interesting critique of feminism. The feminist movement is supposed to represent and advocate for women, a group which we can assume to, at the very least, exist. But in the intellectually curious words of Matt Walsh, what is a woman? Who gets to be included in this group? Who is excluded? And by acknowledging the existence of women, are feminists inadvertently reinforcing an oppressive and constructed gender binary created and imposed to empower patriarchy? Well, I'm not a post-structuralist, nor am I a woman, but one thing I am is a man with a YouTube channel, so I'm going to try to relate some of the interesting things I read in this book and how it made me think about my own masculine identity. Specifically, I want to look at three different views about gender that Judith Butler explores and finish with the most mind-blowing one, Judith Butler's. It's a lot of difficult concepts, so we're going to break the sections up a little bit, put some stuff in between, make it nice. Uh, let's start with second wave feminist Simone de Beauvoir, whose book The Second Sex, published in 1949, has been called the most important book in all feminist literature. You'd think a book published so long ago would be a little dated by now, but there are a lot of Beauvoir's ideas that are still radical even by today's standards. Simone de Beauvoir. Butler actually opens Gender Trouble with a line from Beauvoir. One is not born, but rather becomes a woman. Interesting. 
This would appear to suggest that being a woman is a construction, something that doesn't depend on the situation of one's birth, and it follows that perhaps sex might not need to be connected to gender. Beauvoir believed that men don't have a marked gender in the way that women do, that men are considered the default human being, whereas women are the ones that have actual gender signifiers. What is a woman? Well, here's a list of specific things. What is a man? A man can be anything except those things on a woman list. Now, this is because linguistically, men are the subject and women are the object acted upon by the subject. There's a few quotes from Beauvoir, and just note beforehand that she uses sex and gender interchangeably here, but we can assume she's intending more of a gender meaning. It is only in a human perspective that we can compare the female and the male of the human species. But man is defined as a being who is not fixed, who makes himself what he is. If a woman wants to define herself, they first have to say, I am a woman. All other assertions will arise from this basic truth. A man never begins by positing himself as an individual of a certain sex. That he is a man is obvious. Man is defined as a human being, and woman as a female. Whenever she behaves as a human being, she is said to imitate the male. So let's take that apart. Men are definitely often treated as the default human. Think of phrases like, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Weird not to include roughly 50% of humanity in such a grand statement. Sorry women, this isn't your moment. Start your own space program. As to women being the only real marked gender, there are so many examples for this. Consider the typical bathroom sign. The man is just a human being. Head, arms, body, legs. A lot of women have those things too. That's just a human. Then the woman is depicted as being pretty much the same as a man but with a dress. An arbitrary cultural marker of gender. Men can wear dresses too and in Many cultures around the world, it's not even weird to wear something open and breezy instead of pants. Do they use the same bathroom signs in Scotland or, or uh, Turkey? I didn't do research on this, but I don't know. Maybe you can tell me. Another example, uh, the two types of t-shirt cuts are usually named women and unisex. Okay, Simone de Beauvoir, I'm listening. What is a woman? Uh, a woman wears dresses, has long hair, wears makeup. What is a man? Well, I don't know, but he definitely doesn't wear dresses, have long hair, or wear makeup. That's for sure. I saw a political cartoon once that always stuck with me for some reason, showing doors of opportunity for men versus women. Uh, the man door was just a big open garage door sized opening, and the woman door was in the shape of a stereotypical woman. If the Beauvoir was the cartoonist, she might have drawn the same cartoon, but on the man door, add that same woman shape as a cutout right in the middle of the opening. And then her editor would call her up and be like, Simone, I gotta say, I do not understand this cartoon. And Simone would be like, ah, oh, just read Gender Trouble by Judith Butler. They explain my thoughts on this pretty well. And then her editor would be like, Judith Butler, listen, this is the New York Times, not the post-structuralist gazette. Make it less confusing, please. Yeah, listen, she's a great feminist and all, but uh, I gotta say, <laughs> Simone de Beauvoir would have been a pretty bad cartoonist if she was exactly like I imagined her to be in that act out. Personally, I think there is a ton of truth to Beauvoir's conception of gender. And ever since I read the section about her in Gender Trouble, I've noticed so many examples of what she's talking about in my everyday life. I literally have more examples I'm going to bring up later in the video because it was just too much for one section. I agree, men do often represent the default. I agree as well that women are much more explicitly gendered while men are often thought about as non-women. Now, the one thing I think I disagree with, if it's even what she's saying, I, I very possible I misunderstood, I barely passed film school, again, is the idea that men don't have their own gender markers aside from being the default. As a man, my gender might be less marked than a woman's, but it's still real to me, and I like it. Like, I was living with a couple absolute lads one time, and we started doing this thing where we'd get dressed up in suits and drink whiskey and smoke cigars and watch gangster movies together, and it was awesome. I mean, wearing a suit in general, it feels great. Like, sometimes I'll just put on my suit and hang out at my apartment to feel confident. And in those moments, I don't feel like a default human being. I feel like a man. I've heard trans people speak about experiencing gender euphoria. And while I'm not trans, and I might be doing the cisgender equivalent of stolen valor here, I think maybe I've experienced that sort of feeling too. 
Gender can be a lot of things, but one of the plus sides is that it's just fun sometimes. Okay, let's take a break from gender trouble for a bit. What is it that causes and enforces such a rigid idea of gender to begin with? The all-encompassing gender matrix. I first want to stress here that the consequences of living under the gender matrix are definitely worse for women than they are for men overall. I hope we can all agree on that. But something that isn't talked about so much is the way that same gender matrix harms men, which it absolutely does. Men are usually presumed to benefit from being at the top of the hierarchy put in place by the gender matrix. But there are many ways that this political social system ostensibly set up in our favor harms us as well. As Beauvoir pointed out, the options for women to express their gender are in general much more narrow, much more specific, while men are encouraged to explore a much wider array of options in life. But at the same time, I think people who are assigned female at birth that choose to break society's gender stereotypes are generally less of an outrage or threat than those of us who are assigned male at birth and go on to display stereotypically feminine behaviors. Think of the relative colors of the boys' toy aisle versus the girls' toy aisle. The girls' toy aisle is all pink. The boys' toy aisle is every color except for pink. No pink to be found. If a girl wants to get a toy from the boys' aisle, that's generally okay with all but the most rigidly gender essentialist parents. But if a boy wants to get a pink toy from the girls' aisle, that would probably be a much bigger deal, right? Like, if that boy's willing to dismantle the beloved tradition of not liking stuff that's pink, who knows what he'll dismantle next? If I had to guess, probably Western civilization. We're a couple minutes into this section, so it's time for the big reveal that I'm calling it the all-encompassing gender matrix, but it's much more commonly called the patriarchy. I called it the gender matrix there because A, it sounds cool, and B, because a lot of men have a knee-jerk negative response to that word that I was trying to avoid. But what actually is the patriarchy? Well, in her excellent book, The Will to Change, Men, Masculinity, and Love, Bell Hooks gives a great definition. Patriarchy is a political social system that insists that males are inherently dominating, superior to everything and everyone deemed weak, especially females, and endowed with the right to dominate and rule over the weak and to maintain that dominance through various forms of psychological terrorism and violence. Ha <laughs> ha! Take that, Simone de Beauvoir! Men do have specific things that mark their gender. Women wear dresses. Men use psychological terror and violence against the weak. That's what makes the world go round, baby! Since so much of what we consider masculine is just anything you want, aside from this list of feminine things, you'd think the patriarchy would have set its boys up with all the best shit and given the ladies just a bunch of junk that wouldn't benefit us at all. So, let's check the list. Okay, we got the high paying jobs, nice. We got pockets on our clothing, another win. We got uh, oh, functional armor on our video game characters. Looks like old Papa Patriarchy set us up for success. Okay, and uh, what's this? Looks like at some point in history we made it feminine to have feelings and to love? Wait, wait a second, what? How do we accidentally give away two of the most essential pieces of the human experience along with tied up crop tops and easy bake ovens. Men don't dot their eyes with hearts and they definitely don't talk about love very often. In The Will to Change, Bell Hooks talks about her frustration with men she's dated who can tell her they love her, but they can't really expand on that. They don't have the language. While Bell Hooks grew up being encouraged to express love, to understand love, being able to articulate her love, she noticed that her brother wasn't really allowed to show these parts of himself. I've been in plenty of situations with partners where it's like, I love you. And they're like, tell me more about that. Tell me why. And I'm like, ah, I just don't, don't know. I, uh, I think you're really great. And okay, gotta say something romantic. Uh, you smell like root beer in the sun. Was that good? Did I do a good job at love? But love isn't a girl thing, not really. Love actually is all around us. Remember when Hugh Grant said that in that movie? Love is like one of the best things about being alive. Have you ever heard a song? Like any song? 
And then there's the thing about feeling feelings. We all know women are emotional. Therefore, by Beauvoir's inverse law of masculinity, men must be emotionless robots. Except that's not quite true, is it? Men learn to hide their emotions. Men learn to bottle up their emotions or just ignore them. But that doesn't mean men aren't emotional. It's also important to point out here that patriarchal men aren't the only people who uphold ideas like this. There are plenty of women who enforce the rules of the gender prison as well. One of the most heartbreaking parts of The Will to Change is where Hooks admits that in the past when she's dated men who are in touch with their emotions, who can cry in front of her, she's found a kind of a turnoff. The patriarchy doesn't respect men who cry, and that patriarchal disrespect even embedded itself behind enemy lines in the brain of one of our greatest feminist writers. This whole thing actually kind of fucked me up for a long time. I got it into my head as a kid that if I wanted to be a man, I shouldn't cry. I think I remember crying when my high school girlfriend dumped me when I was 18, but the next time I cried was maybe 28 years old? I had people in my life move away, people died, I went through breakups, I watched so many sad movies, I never cried. I didn't even come close. I used to be a kindergarten teacher in South Korea, right? And my last day had all these like adorable Korean five-year-olds like hugging me and crying and being like, James teacher, we will miss you. And I was just like, yeah, I, yep, I, bet, I bet you will. Well, good luck with grade one. Sorry I never uh, taught you guys the letter X. Honestly, it doesn't come up that much, so you should be fine. And then I gave each of them a respectful handshake and was on my way. I got to a point where I really wanted to cry, but I physically couldn't. I remember I watched the movie Gravity, and there's the part with George Clooney, and I was like, oh wow, I, I think I'm about to cry. And when I didn't, I rewound it and watched it again, skipping around to the, the saddest parts, hoping it would take me over the edge, treating this scene and this Oscar-nominated film exactly like the money shot in a Pornhub video, like re-watching it, trying to get my eyes to come. Like, there's a reason they call these movies tearjerkers. Anyway, a few years after that, I eventually did cry, and now I'm happy to say I cry all the time. I cry constantly. I'll cry at a Netflix trailer for a Queer Eye episode. I'll cry at a YouTube pre-roll ad. I once cried reading a brochure for Newfoundland. Crying is good. It feels good to cry. It's a physical and emotional release that I just didn't allow myself to have for a long time, all because, I don't know, I must have watched a cowboy movie at an impressionable age or something. Also, here's a hot tip. If you're looking to understand more of the ways that patriarchy affects men, I recommend listening to the stories of trans men, because trans men are men who have had to actually think about gender in a way that a lot of cis men just haven't. For starters, there's this amazing post by Tumblr user Scaldish the Mad Muse, and it's so good that in this essay that includes quotes from Simone de Beauvoir, Judith Butler, Bell Hooks, this is going to be by far the longest quote, and it's from a guy named, once again, Scaldish the Mad Muse. I had to include all this. I still cut it down massively, though, so still check out the original. Scaldish is a trans man who's speaking here about the feeling of emotional isolation that many men feel under the all-encompassing gender matrix. It's now blatantly clear to me that most cis men probably experience chronic emotional malnutrition. They're deprived of social connection just enough for it to seriously fuck with their psyches, but not enough for them to realize that it's happening and what's causing it. When I'm out in public and interact with women, all of them come off as incredibly aloof, cold, and mirthless. I have never experienced this before, even though I know exactly what this composure is the armor that keeps away creepy-ass men. As someone who used to wear it myself, I know this armor is 100% impersonal. Nobody likes wearing it, and I can say with absolute certainty that women would dump the armor in favor of unconditional companionship with men if doing this didn't run the risk of actual assault. But I only have a complete understanding of this context because I've experienced female socialization. If I hadn't, I would have thought this coldness was a conspiracy against me devised by roughly half the human population. And as for male socialization... Again, it seems taboo for a man to be platonically intimate with men for reasons I have yet to fully understand, but I think it boils down to A, the fact that society teaches boys that it's not okay to be soft with each other, and B, garden variety homophobia. This human connection is as essential for our well-being as water is. 
It's kind of profound, right? I'd also recommend you check out Fantastic Mr. Fox's channel, particularly the video Lost in Transition, which goes deeper into what I'm talking about right now. So men don't talk about love. Men don't talk about their feelings. And sometimes they don't even realize they're feeling them. What does living with chronic emotional malnourishment like that do to us? As you may have guessed, nothing good. Men are much less likely to go to therapy than women. The fatal suicide rate for men is quite high. In the US, it's around four times higher than the rate for women. Also, way higher rates of physical violence, drug and alcohol abuse, addiction, drug-related deaths like ODs and drunk driving. And also, men are extremely disproportionately affected by mental illness related to anger management. This shit sucks. This emotional malnourishment caused by the gender matrix is a huge problem affecting so many men. I feel like any solutions I might offer here will be almost useless, but my dudes, if you can afford therapy or you have access through work, you should absolutely go for it. Talk to your dude friends about serious life stuff. We need to be there for each other. And if you're considering suicide, you gotta reach out to a crisis hotline. Under the current gender matrix, let's just call it the patriarchy at this point, it's hard for men to understand the problems it causes them. Of course men don't like to talk about the patriarchy. You know who that's good for? The patriarchy. To end male pain, to respond effectively to male crisis, we have to name the problem. We have to both acknowledge that the problem is patriarchy and work to end patriarchy if men are to reclaim their essential goodness of male being, if they are to regain the space of open-heartedness and emotional expressiveness that is the foundation of well-being, we must envision alternatives to patriarchal masculinity. We must all change. Like Bell Hooks said, step one needs to be naming the problem. So let's get comfortable using the wet ass P word. Talk to your boys about patriarchy. Luce rigore. Is that how you fucking say it? Lucie. Lucie. Irrigare. Oh, fuck yeah. I'm gonna throw those French R's in there. Lucie irrigare. All right, we're back to gender trouble. So another feminist theorist with a very different conception of women and gender is Luce Irrigare. Irrigare disagrees with Beauvoir on a few things. For one, Irrigare says that instead of men being the subject and women the object, men are the object and the subject. Women actually cannot be represented by language because language is phologocentric. It all makes so much more sense when you put it like that, huh? Imagine if I just used the word phologocentric and I didn't explain what it meant. I just moved on. So uh, this strange word is a combination of phallus, meaning a symbolic penis, uh, logos, meaning language, and centric, meaning, I don't know, like, centric, yeah. Uh, according to Irrigare, if our language is phologocentric, it was created to represent men, and it cannot possibly represent women. Uh, the system under which this took place is referred to as the masculine signifying economy, which is kind of like another word for patriarchy, but more specifically to do with language and the marketplace of ideas. According to Irrigare, within the masculine signifying economy, the feminine cannot be differentiated from the masculine. Within language, women are a linguistic absence. They cannot be accurately described. It's a complex topic to take in, so let's let Butler shed some light on things. For Irrigare, the feminine could never be the mark of a subject, as Beauvoir would suggest. Further, the feminine could not be theorised in terms of a determinate relation between the masculine and the feminine within any given discourse, for discourse is not a relevant notion here. Even in their variety, discourses constitute so many modalities of phallogocentric language. The female sex is thus also the subject that is not one. The relation between masculine and feminine cannot be represented in a signifying economy in which the masculine constitutes the closed circle of signifier and signified. Okay, run that by me again in English, please. I told you this book is not for cowards. Irrigare is making a really bold claim, so I'm going to try to explain what she means, even though I'm not 100% sure I fully agree and I am 100% sure I don't fully understand what Irrigare or Butler was talking about with all this. So 
the idea that language is philogocentric, I can accept, and I agree, that language construction often serves the purposes of those in power. Uh, for the genders, that would be men. There are examples of sexist, misogynist language everywhere. The word fireman implies only men can work in this job. The prefixes miss and misses exist to signal to men which women are single and which are married, which is pretty objectifying, serving the same purpose as a for sale or sold sticker on items at an auction. And I mean, you know, women can call themselves Ms., but then they're labeling themselves as uh, like a feminist, someone who is, you know, trying to fight the patriarchy. So in every case, these labels exist for men, it could be said. Many popular common sense understandings about women also conveniently reinforce the existence of an oppressed class to serve men and be aesthetically pleasing to men while they do it. Weird coincidence, right? You know, ideas like women like to dress up and look pretty, women would prefer to stay home and raise children than have a career, women are just better at cooking and cleaning and doing laundry than men. If the men folk tried any of those things, we'd just mess it up, and the women would be upset. Best to let the girls handle it, because that's nature. I'm gonna guess there's no biological difference between men and women that causes one group to excel at folding laundry and gives the other an advantage at collecting a paycheck. I know for a fact that there are plenty of people in uh, both binary genders who genuinely enjoy cooking, raising children, or wearing makeup, but the idea that women like to do these things or are better at doing these things is very common and reinforced by the language we use to speak about them. But Irigaré actually goes further than that. Because of the philogocentric nature of the masculine signifying economy, feel kind of cool that I started a sentence like that. Anyway, uh, because of that, women are not only oppressed by language, but they are completely absent from it. What is a woman? I would have to invent a new language to answer that question. Actually, I couldn't, no, I couldn't do it, but women would have to do this. So far, the descriptions of women are oppressive and serve the interests of men. Now, if we try to remove that oppression, we only turn women into men, which is also incorrect. This happens due to the closed circle of masculine signifier and masculine signified. I know, I know, it's confusing, but language really does represent men more accurately. Describing men and women in the same way often carries different connotations for both. If I describe a man who stays late in the office every night, he's driven, ambitious. A woman who works late might be neglecting her family. A man pushing a baby stroller is dad of the year. A woman pushing a baby stroller is just doing what she should. A man who has a lot of sex is a stud. A woman who has a lot of sex is your mom. See, right there, that was a really sexist joke. How did that get in there? I think it happened because of philogocentrism. To be clear, personally, I have nothing but respect for your mother's nuts and record-busting throat, but because I made that joke within the masculine signifying economy, it was implied that the years your mom spent developing her palate to become a globally renowned sommelier of the scrotum should be seen as a negative, as a mark against her. Is there any way out of this? Well, I could try flipping the script we started with here and say that actually, your mom hiring a portion of Joe Biden's campaign staff to help schedule dick appointments makes her a stud. But now I've just revealed the default masculine nature of the signifying economy, trying to make my language less oppressive to your well-dicked mother, calling her a stud to accurately represent her as a woman, only makes her into a man. We find ourselves trapped in Irregaré's closed circle of masculine signifier and masculine signified. And unfortunately, this closed masculine circle isn't six guys jacking off on your mom. Okay, I... I hope I've made my point here. I sincerely apologize to anyone I, I have upset with those jokes. Chill Goblin is an officially sex-positive channel, slut-positive channel, and what your lovely mother does in the bedroom is, of course, between her and her local hockey teams. On the other hand, don't we actually have words that represent women? Can't we describe women using words? And can't women create new words to describe themselves? Do women really have to invent a whole new language in order to be properly articulated and described? Is the only correct answer to the question, what is a woman?
It, it is an interesting claim to consider. Personally, I don't think so. But also, like I said, not quite sure I really understood what El Regaré was getting at, so please feel free to enlighten me here. Toxic masculinity. Toxic masculinity, one of the most misunderstood terms on this earth. A lot of our brothers in the gender struggle have had their questions go unanswered. So let's right now go through a couple frequently unanswered questions or fucks and take them seriously. Uh, yeah, I got a fuck. Is toxic masculinity saying that all masculinity is toxic? Oh, definitely not. No way. Many forms of masculinity are cool and nice. Like wearing a shirt that's got a fully covered print of an anime dragon. There's nothing toxic about that. That's just good, clean fun. Toxic masculinity specifically refers to learned and enforced masculine attitudes that affect everyone negatively. Things like a tendency toward violence and aggression, an inability to admit weakness or report injury, extreme self-reliance, and hateful patriarchal attitudes like misogyny, homophobia, and transphobia. Uh, yeah, I got a follow-up fuck. So isn't this just another term invented by man-hating feminists to make all men look bad? Well, no, that's not, that's not what feminists do. But actually, get this. The term toxic masculinity was coined by the original men's rights activists, the Mythopoetic Men's Movement. This was a group of men who saw themselves as aligned with feminists. The MMMs, or MMs, had a lot of cool ideas and did some cringe shit as well, like going on retreats in the woods where they'd dress up in stereotypically indigenous clothing and bang on drums and try to get in touch with a deep masculine. But somewhere in that process, they also coined the term toxic masculinity, which is an extremely useful concept to understand to get us all out of the gender prison. So you, you gotta give them that. Um, check out Little Hoot's excellent video on the topic if you want a full rundown on the movement. Yeah, I gotta, I gotta fuck. Um, now, a question. If I washed my ass, would that make me gay? Oh, great question. We actually get this question a lot. So, uh, the answer is yes. 100%. There's no way around it. Uh, anyway, enough questions. Let's move on. Toxic masculinity can be found in some of the qualities of men most aggressively imposed by the patriarchy that are harmful to us men and to those around us. The idea that being a man requires total self-reliance is a big one. This has consequences for men, like almost never going to the doctor, driving past exhaustion, or refusing to stop working or playing a sport after an injury, or just being unable to ask for help in any situation. I too find it really hard to ask for help, so in a brave and selfless gesture toward eliminating toxic masculinity, I will now demonstrate what it looks like to do so. Okay, <clears throat> All right, not easy for me. Uh, please, I need help. Subscribe to my Patreon and give me the money that I require for life. This was really, really hard for me to do, but I hope it inspires you to ask for help in your own life. And also, it inspires you to give me your money. I, I need it. Give it over. Give it over. What are you even doing with it? I spoke earlier about men being conditioned not to feel emotions, but the notable exception to this is anger. Anger is our consolation prize. Anger is often seen as acceptable from men and boys under certain contexts, a way to express feelings without losing masculinity points, probably because it can lead to violence, physical or emotional. Men are far overrepresented in violent, angry outbursts when compared to women, and this makes all of us less safe, particularly the women in our lives. Toxic masculine violence also loops back around and reinforces that masculine emotional malnourishment. Bell hooks again. The first act of violence that patriarchy demands of males is not violence towards women. Instead, patriarchy demands of all males that they engage in acts of psychic self-mutilation that they kill off the emotional parts of themselves. If an individual is not successful in emotionally ruining himself, he can count on patriarchal men to enact rituals of power that will assault his self-esteem. Isn't that a great quote? Go back and listen to it again. I'm not gonna play it twice. That'd be cheesy. But you should just go back and play it again. It's, 
is worth hearing twice. Easily one of the two best descriptions of how toxic masculinity works I've ever heard. The other one is from a bit by comedian Bill Burr about a time he decided to go buy a pumpkin for Halloween. It took me four trips to the supermarket to finally be able to find this goddamn pumpkin. Because every time I would walk in there to get it, I'd be thinking all these happy thoughts. This is a great thing. I'm embracing the holiday. It's going to bring me and my girlfriend together. This is a very loving thing to do. And I'd reach out to get it, and all I'd hear in the back of my mind would be, What are you? Gay? And immediately I'd have to turn around and walk out. Let me explain that joke to functional people in the crowd. Let me explain this. This is how it works for guys. Anytime you do anything remotely sensitive, heartwarming, anything that's going to make you a more loving, caring individual, immediately all your guy friends suggest that maybe, just maybe, you want to suck a dick. What are you, gay, is the reason why guys drop dead at 55 out of fucking nowhere. It's literally from five decades of just suppressing the urge to hug a puppy. Admit a baby is cute. Say you want a cookie. You just gotta keep pushing it down like, fuck that, I'm not sucking dick. I'm not sucking dick. Slightly weird to throw a Bill Burr quote right after Bell Hooks, but I gotta say it felt right to me. Uh, it's a great bit, very true, really funny. I'll put a link in the description if you'd like to hear the full thing in its proper context, but I'll just add a content warning here that in the original, the word he uses isn't gay, so be aware that there are gonna be a, a few homophobic slurs. How many times in your life have you heard the phrase, be a man? Sometimes it can be something innocent, like what you might yell desperately at a frog after you kiss it. But quite often, telling someone to be a man in this way is a very effective way to manipulate them. It's a kind of code, encouraging them to turn off their emotions, to work through pain or fatigue, or to commit violence without hesitation or remorse. Just like when men are called misogynistic or homophobic insults, it's a way to exert patriarchal dominance over someone by threatening their masculinity. You must do as they say, or you'll be less of a man in some way. Maybe you're pointing out unsafe working conditions to your boss, and he tells you to be a man. Maybe you're one of the many male victims of domestic violence, and a family member or a partner who's abusing you tells you to man up. Are you a boy or a man? Maybe you're like Bill Burr. After a lifetime of gender conditioning, you no longer require a physical person to threaten your masculinity because you've internalized that voice of patriarchal authority and you just hear it in your head now. What are you, gay? I suspect one reason why men are socialized by the patriarchy to shut off all emotions but anger and to unquestioningly perform violence may have something to do with the fact that these qualities make people excellent soldiers. War and glory on the battlefield are tied to masculinity in subtle and obvious ways. A cold man, a violent man, and a man with respect for patriarchal authority makes a terrible husband, father, or friend, but a great tool for imperialism. It's often said outright that weak men will cause the downfall of civilization. Hard times create strong men. Strong men create good times. Good times create weak men. And weak men create hard times. You ever heard that quote? Julius Caesar. Just joking. It's actually from a science fiction novel by G. Michael Hopf, a former U.S. Marine and current owner of a 104 follower Twitter account. <laughs> Look at him trying to get credit from uh, Tim Pool quoting him. Amazing. <laughs> Two likes. Oh, boy. Oh, wow, wow. What a meatball. Anyway, <clears throat> this quote and the general idea are everywhere. I've heard Joe Rogan say it about 50 times. It feels true, even though it is not true historically. I, I'm not going to elaborate on that because others have made the point better than I could. I'll just say that the idea is used quite a bit to shit on men who are perceived as weak or who are not conforming to their gender properly. It literally translates to, you're drinking a fruit flavored beer? Fool, your impudence has doomed us all. Now, is there a way out of this part of the prison of gender? Sadly, there's nothing you can read or understand on your own to prevent other patriarchal men from enacting their rituals of power to assault your self-esteem because they see you stepping outside of the acceptable boundaries of gender you may find yourself in situations where it's not physically safe to play with gender in the way that you might like. Depending on your social status or your perceived masculinity, 
You might be in a position to protect others from this treatment. You might be safe calling out others for treating people in this way. But I would advise you to approach situations like this with caution. But have hope. I don't believe these toxically masculine qualities are innate to men. If they were, why would the patriarchy have to work so hard to instill these values on us? Why would Joe Rogan be so terrified about the rise of so-called weak men? It's because this isn't us. As far as the assault on your self-esteem goes, hopefully you can realize that only you get to decide if you're a man. Your gender identity doesn't hang in the balance of whether or not you finish your shift at Booster Juice with a freshly broken wrist. Your black t-shirt with a skull on it won't turn into a frilly dress the second you book your first therapy appointment. You won't feel your pronouns transform werewolf-like, the H opening like a hidden chest and forcing out a new slithering member of the family, the I and the M curling like fingers in springs just because you decided to do four keg stands tonight instead of five. Your status as a man is not based on any of that. Buy the pumpkin, say the baby's cute, ask for a cookie, take care of yourself. Gender performativity. So what does Judith Butler think of gender? To Butler, gender is performative. Gender isn't something you are, it's something you do. As she puts it, Gender is the repeated stylization of the body, a set of repeated acts within a highly rigid regulatory frame that congeal over time to produce the appearance of substance, of a natural sort of being. So when someone puts on a dress, or participates in any repeated stylization of the body within the rigid regulatory frame of gender, they are engaging in a performance of a kind. They're presenting to the world an image because of the context of the performance and the audience for it, they can expect to be seen in a certain way. I mentioned earlier about how I sometimes feel a sense of what I assume is gender euphoria. It'll happen when I'm doing something that makes me feel particularly manly. When I take a second to picture what I look like or check myself out in the mirror or a photo, I didn't always have the words to express it, but I kind of think to myself something like, God damn, I am nailing this gender performance right now. Anyway, I better finish my cigar and ride this bear cavalry into battle. You ever have that moment? Gender's fun, man. I was camping a couple weeks ago, and one guy there had a beard, and he was just pounding back beers, starting the fire, chopping wood, chewing tobacco, the whole deal. And one of my friends said to him, you are easily my most masculine friend. And I was in the middle of reading Gender Trouble at the time, and I had all these ideas swirling around in my head, and I was like, yes, you are performing gender very well. <laughs> what I didn't expect was that saying that would kind of make everybody upset and uncomfortable. The masculine friend was like, well, I don't think it's a performance. This is just how I am naturally. I'm not trying to perform for anybody. And my other friend was like, yeah, chill goblin. Uh, maybe some people are performing gender, but not him. He's always been like this. In that moment, I wasn't expecting pushback and I was just trying to sum up all of gender trouble like, listen, fellas, Simone de Beauvoir once said, one is not born, but rather becomes a woman. But the thing is, according to Judith Butler, they were right to feel this way. Butler wasn't saying that gender is a performance. They were saying that gender is performative. For Judith, I can call him that, we're close, uh, that set of repeated acts that constitutes gender performativity includes everything about us, just about. The way we walk, the way we sit, the way we wait for the bus. Everything about us communicates gender performatively, whether we're conscious of it or not. The thing is, humans always want to identify. I'm this, I'm that. And drag is really the antithesis of that. Part of the reason people have an aversion to drag is because it breaks the fourth wall. Because it's so punk rock. It says, you know what? Look. I'm a man. Look, now I'm a woman. Look, now I'm a cowboy. Look, now I'm a sailor. Now I'm this alien. Nobody likes the actor who breaks the fourth wall because it takes them out of their high, out of their fantasy. Great quote from RuPaul there, but I feel it would be irresponsible of me not to mention that there was another part of the same podcast where RuPaul said, it's okay to say the T-slur, which 
wasn't great. Plus, he also thinks that fracking is punk rock. So anyway, Judith actually brings up drag as a performance of gender a couple times in Gender Trouble, once at the beginning and once at the end. To Butler, drag is a parody of gender, something that when we see it, it reveals to us just how performed gender is. I think parody is a great word to describe drag. Like RuPaul's description of drag, parodies break the fourth wall, winking at the audience who are familiar with what's being parodied. Parodies often point out tropes in an exaggerated way. Like, for example, a parody of a We're in Hell video would be like, Hey everyone, so this video is going to be a little bit of a departure from what I normally talk about. We're going to be discussing one of the most cursed reality shows I've ever seen. It's called My Dad's Instagram Stories, and fun fact, they actually have a lot to teach us about neoliberalism. Frederick Jameson once said, Hey, you ever notice how he always does that? Starts his videos by saying, hey everyone. Maybe you never noticed that before, but now you do through the magic of parody. In a similar way, when we see a man performing drag who wears feminine clothes, walks with a feminine hip swish, speaks with a feminine inflection, we realize that these gender signifiers aren't tied to biological sex, and we're left to ask ourselves just what gender is anyway. How do I know my gender? If I'm attracted to this man, what does that say about me? You know, just like how I feel when I watch a Weird in Hell video. We come on stage into the performance of gender at birth, and we're not given much time to learn our lines. Just like that German key, completely neutralized by a baby, might be given gendered significance by those around him. Look at that little baby drew him all over his shirt. Well, boys will be boys, eh? Maybe I am just naturally into all the stuff I think I am, and I would have been with or without any outside input. Put my brain into any other person's body, would I still drink IPAs and sit with my legs spread and have watched every Jason Statham movie and have watched every Jason Statham movie for the same reasons? I'm not so sure about that. This is the last part of that Judith Butler quote, that these repeated acts of gender performed by people all around us and in the media we consume, these performances congeal over time to produce the appearance of a natural sort of being. The more people buy into the performative version of gender, the more natural it seems, the more connected gender appears to biological sex. I'll mention here briefly that not everyone agrees with Judith Butler about gender as performative. Notably, and I'm not really the best person to articulate this criticism, but some trans people criticize Judith Butler's theory as being dismissive of the idea that people are born trans, that their gender is intrinsic to who they are. Now, that's a completely valid objection to the text, which unfortunately doesn't really talk about trans people at all. It's a huge missing piece from what's otherwise a wide-ranging and deep discussion of gender. To their credit, Butler has acknowledged this criticism and seems really grateful for the trans people who pointed this out, saying that since writing this text in the 80s, they've learned a lot from trans people, you know, because they're actually interested in knowledge and truth, and so they see criticisms as chances to learn instead of claiming that anyone who doesn't agree with them is trying to silence them. Personally, I still find the theory very convincing. Butler has clarified later on that just because gender is performative, that doesn't mean that we can just choose our own gender. Gender is deeply ingrained in us. It is a part of who we are. It's a part of our identity. When you learn about the performative nature of gender, you aren't given the power to change your gender at will. It's still a part of you. Another misconception about the theory is that it's saying gender isn't real. As Butler has also clarified, gender is real. Whether it's a construction or performative, it's still an enormously powerful historical and social reality. That said, you are under no obligation to agree with everything Judith Butler or Irigaré or de Beauvoir or Chill Goblin say about gender. You can form your own opinion at home for free. I've been thinking a lot about that RuPaul quote lately, since there's been just so much hate and violence targeted against drag queens reading to children or performing for children or just really just existing anywhere. Why would anyone get upset that kids are seeing someone dressed up in colorful clothes, talking in a silly voice. What's 
wrong with anyone willing to go into a library and promote children's literacy? Why is someone breaking the fourth wall of gender in front of children so frightening to so many people? To piggyback off of RuPaul's point, I suspect the unconscious worry is that showing children anything that reveals through parody the constructed performative nature of gender will allow children to see through the walls of the gender prison before they've been locked inside. Boys don't wear dresses. Really? That's interesting because I saw a boy at the library who was wearing a dress and he looked great. I don't know why I don't want to just wear these matching jean jackets. The reality is, we all do a little drag from time to time. A guy who doesn't eat meat, or a guy who has a therapist, or a guy who does yoga. They're all breaking the fourth wall of gender in some way, and by that token, everyone on Earth is in drag at some point. There's nobody who actually fits every stereotype of a man. And if there is, and if you're watching this, you should really cut back on the cigarettes. But if you're a guy watching this video, I'm positive You've experienced a moment in your life when someone called you out for not performing your gender properly. What is with that? Well, I think that some people spend so much time trapped in that prison of gender that they become prison guards. When they see someone unlocking the door for themselves or even just looking around and acknowledging that there is a prison, they have to step in and lay down the law. And this is the law of the patriarchy. The Manosphere. If you're a young man frustrated at life, confused by what you're hearing about your gender, or if you're just looking for romantic advice or ways to meet people to have sex with, you'll probably go on the internet and search things up. There's a huge number of young men asking these sorts of questions online. Young men who might sense that they are in a prison of some kind, but not know the way out. Now, this is usually the point where the dark, shadowy force known as the Manosphere latches its tendrils around these confused, frustrated demographic, offers to answer their questions, and then just force-feeds them nothing but further suffering. Come this way, it says to the young men, like the clown from It, if it were also a pickup artist. Follow me to escape this place and live your dreams. <laughs> it promises, gesturing in a direction that only draws its victims deeper into the gender prison. It fills their heads with repressive, patriarchal, rigidly gender-essentialist propaganda dressed up as science and self-help, telling them that they're finally waking up from all the lies, but just feeding them more of the lies they've always been hearing. You're a man. These are women. You should be mean to them. They actually like it when you do that. You should never cry. You should try and attain the most beautiful woman possible. They are objects. They are like animals to hunt. You are like a hunter, just like your ancestors, hunting woolly mammoth across the plains of Africa and then manipulating the mammoth into sex and never calling it again. Believe it or not, a sizable chunk of these dudes do not have success with women even after this incredible advice, which throws them into the involuntary celibate world. Best they can hope for at that point is usually hearing someone like Jordan Peterson tell them to clean your room, bucko, and maybe then they can turn their life around. But at no point in this process do they ever really interrogate gender or patriarchy or toxic masculinity. Gender is an innate biological thing that is not to be challenged or questioned. The patriarchy? Why, that's a natural hierarchy that must be upheld at the risk of destroying civilization. Toxic masculinity is nothing but a feminist lie to make you ashamed of being a natural natural man. When I say bullshit like this, it makes me sad. It makes me sad. I'm so glad I came of age on the internet before things like Gamergate or the rise of the intellectual dark web. I fell so hard into the new atheist movement, I wonder if I could have become a Jordan Peterson guy if I were just a few years younger. The worst it ever got for me was posting a Reddit comment describing a Sam Harris atheist argument as delicious. I lay in bed at night and ask myself, why? Why why delicious? What what was delicious about it? Couldn't I have found any other word? For anyone not in his target demographic, Jordan Peterson seems to be just a ridiculous, uncool, bigoted old man. And yeah, 
those are great descriptors of the guy. You, you did a good job saying what he is. But he's also one of the most successful people in this entire space, appealing directly to the exact young men we are talking about. Peterson's fans have real problems. Their frustration is justified. Frustration about patriarchy, toxic masculinity, capitalism. We should maybe spend more time trying to figure out why so many of them end up as followers of the guy who's basically the poster boy for all of these things. Leftists love to make fun of Jordan Peterson for constantly crying in his appearances. I did it twice in my last video and it wasn't even about him at all. It's just funny when Jordan Peterson cries, right? But I was thinking like, why, why is it funny? Is it funny because he's a man and he's saying all these sexist patriarchal things and yet he cries, which he's not supposed to do as a man? I wonder if his tears are a massively underrated part of his appeal. You know, cutting yourself off from emotion is such a central tenet of toxic masculinity, and a man crying in public is usually met with ridicule. This is someone who young men, emotionally stunted through no fault of their own, can look at and at least think, hey, maybe it is okay to cry. Maybe I can cry and still be a respected figure among the patriarchy, like Jordan Peterson. But Jordan Peterson tells them they can only have that through the Faustian bargain of becoming a conservative. You want to cry? Well, then clean your room and worship hierarchy, bucko. And they would probably benefit from someone like that on the left. Not going to be me, though. Oh, I can cry. I cry all the time. I'm just not comfortable enough in my masculinity to do it on camera. What I will do is make a commitment right here. I'm not going to make fun of Jordan Peterson for crying anymore. I actually have no issue with the fact that he cries. I'm going to make fun of him for being a horrible, transphobic fascist who is poisoning the minds of the impressionable young men who follow him, reinforcing the security of the gender prison, and enlisting his followers to do the same, welcoming them to a pitiful life as both prisoner and guard of gender conventions. And I'm going to make fun of his voice. Yeah, definitely going to make fun of his voice. Wait, I mean, it sounds like Kermit the Frog. What am I supposed to do? Not bring that up? He's a public speaker. He, he, he has a podcast. He does his own audiobooks. He sounds like a frog puppet. Anyway, gender can be a mental prison sometimes, and you can escape that prison for periods of time or turn it into something fun. Gender is fun. It's a fun little game humans made up. You get to wear clothes and look good. You get to say fun stuff like, it's a guy thing. And it interacts with sexuality and sexual attraction. It makes sex interesting, which is, that's probably like one of my favorite parts about it. And also, gender theory is fucking interesting. And I guess having a better understanding of it will legitimately help you in life. Also, I didn't get into nearly everything that's cool and interesting about gender in this video. I barely mentioned non-binary people at all who are valid and non-binary masked people are affected by a lot of the issues that I raised here. So I'm going to list in the description a bunch of other video essays on the topic by trans people and women and hey, a couple cis guys too, because it's cool for men to be curious about gender. Definitely read that Bell Hooks book, The Will to Change. Uh, read that Tumblr post. Uh, do what you can to get out of the prison or realize when you're in it. Trans rights are human rights. They must be protected. Non-binary people are valid. And again, this is hard for me to ask, but subscribe to my Patreon.